You got a Bible? All right. Let's get at it. John chapter 17. Gospel of John chapter 17. I probably will do more teaching than preaching this morning. So listen to the Word of God and this is what God led on my heart. I'm, I don't know why, but uh, maybe it's just be a good New Year's Eve type sermon. Uh, New Year's Eve is about starting things over again and looking ahead to the future and so on. And, and uh, things that we didn't do quite right last year, we're going to try to straighten it up and do it better this year. And you can tell that that's what's in everybody's mind because, I'm not kidding you, the day after Christmas... The stores were pulling down all of the Christmas stuff and pulling out their treadmills. Because everybody says, I'm going to lose weight this year. I'm going to lose 100 pounds this year. So they go buy a treadmill. And it sits. Do never, never do anything with it. But anyway, I'm one of these that I don't believe that you can do anything. Okay, that's what I believe about you. I do not believe that you can do anything without the grace and the help of Almighty God. Amen. Without God being in it. If God's in it, He'll bless it. If God's in it, He'll multiply it, He'll make it fruitful. If God's in it, you don't have to worry about how it's going to turn out. It's just going to turn out the way God wants it to turn out. And uh, that's where you get into that trust and that faith in God, that God is far wiser than you are. He is, he's told us in his word that as high as the heavens are above the earth, that's how high his thoughts are above our thoughts. Okay? And uh, there is an immense, huge, large gap between earth and the edge of the known universe. We don't even know how far away that is. And God is beyond that. And he's saying, that's, if, if, you're, if, that's, if we're on the first grade... Just imagine what level school God's in, okay? That's how, that's how high above His ways uh, that they are above our ways. And so I just believe that let God do things that you cannot do and let God overcome things in your life that you want overcome, but you do not have the power to do it. And if there's anything that I like to preach and anything I like to really just instill in people's hearts and people's minds, is that I believe in the absolute sovereignty of God. God does not sit in heaven and worry about how we're going to turn out. God's very proactive with His people. And if God wants you in a certain place, in a certain day, doing a certain thing, guess what's going to happen? It's going to happen exactly the way God said it, He wanted it to happen. And I... Through life, I learned to yield more and more of my will and what I want over to the Lord. That way the Lord gets the praise, the Lord takes the credit, He gets all the glory for it, because I don't need it, but Jesus deserves it. And it applies especially in this area we're going to talk about this morning and maybe next Sunday morning, I'm not sure, uh, I put so many verses in my in my presentation here, and then I got to thinking, Mike, you'll never get through all those. Okay. So anyway, John chapter 17. This is the prayer that Jesus prayed to His heavenly Father the night before He's going to be hung on a cross. And if you've never read this prayer, just get in a quiet place somewhere, I was going to say go down in the woods and get alone, but you'll probably freeze to death down there. It's supposed to be minus four or five, something like that in the morning. So anyway, but get alone somewhere and just pray and then read John 17. You're going to see the heart of your Savior. He's opening up his heart. He's sharing his, his thoughts with us as he's praying these things to God. And I just love it. First time I, first time I remember reading this chapter, I wept. I bawled like a baby over this because it just meant so much to me. So John chapter 17, verse 11, and he says, uh, And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I am come to thee, 
Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, and here it is, that they may be one as we are. Jesus is one with the Father. Do we believe that? We believe it. Do we understand it totally? No. But He is one with the Father. 1 John 5, 7, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Uh, but even in the name of God in Hebrew, it has a, has a plural ending. The words um, given to God, the, the, the word El would mean God, and the word Elohim means God in the plural. And in the Old Testament, a lot of places, that's what you're going to find is Elohim, meaning God in the plural. And even in the Old Testament, God was giving a, a hint as to His nature that He is Father, He is Son, He is Spirit or Holy Ghost, and that there are three and there are one in the wilderness tabernacle, in the temple. There was the table of showbread, that's Christ. There was the candlestick, that's the Holy Spirit. And then there was the Ark of the Covenant, that's God's throne. And they were all three separate, and yet they were one together in one tabernacle doing the same thing. When Jesus was baptized, we clearly see Jesus coming up out of the water. We see that the Bible mentions a voice coming from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And then we see the Holy Ghost descending down from heaven and resting upon his shoulder. Uh, and that was the Holy Spirit coming down in the form of a dove. So clearly they are three, and yet they are one. Meaning that in, in one sense of the meaning, one of those three never does anything else against the other two. You never have the Holy Ghost speaking against Christ or the Father. You don't see Jesus uh, speaking against the Holy Ghost and His Father. You don't see the Father doing anything but glorifying His own Son, Jesus Christ. They are never in disagreement. Never. Now that is a state of perfected oneness. Perfected oneness. They never disagree. They never argue. Jesus willingly came to this earth, testifying, saying, Lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written to me to do thy will, O God. Jesus wanted to complete the mission that God sent him for. He did not want to vary from it in any way, shape, or form. And he wanted everybody to know and to believe that if they saw him, they saw the Father. There was no difference. And yet they were different and they were separate. That, again, is what I refer to as perfected oneness. Now, we don't have that down here. In a marriage, even in the best of all godly marriages, they are as one, and yet between them, there's going to be disagreements, variances. Okay? But if you are... If you are, what's the word I want? If you are dead set toward unity in your marriage, unity. Unity in your relationship between you and God. United with God. One with God. That's what he said, that they may be one as we are. United together with a local congregation. Joined together with maybe untold thousands or millions of people all over the world that are true Bible-believing Christians, and we may never meet them, but we'll see them up in heaven. I'm not sure that we can ever have that perfect oneness here on this earth but we can have that spirit of unity in us in cooperation and in unity. And 
I, I'm, I'm getting to where I'm going to have to read some more scriptures here so I know which way God wants to take this thing. But I'm going to preach on unity. I'm going to preach on oneness. I'm going to preach this, the issue of oneness in a marriage. Preach, preach the issue of oneness in a family. Oneness in the home. Oneness as far as, um, as far as our church goes. Oneness between us and God. Unity among the 50 states that make up the United States of America. Now let me touch on that just for a minute. Jesus said, and it's true, a house or a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. Cannot do it. It'll break apart, it'll fall, it'll collapse. Does that make sense to everybody? We have relationships all over this country that have nothing to do with being... A, we have husbands and wives that are constantly going, attacking one another, hurting one another, deliberately going after one another, and they're not in unison. They, there's, no, there's no unity there. There's no oneness there. And it won't work. What, it, what that kind of stuff will do is that'll break apart that whole family. Those kids are getting sick and tired of mom and dad yelling and screaming at one another. And so they walk off in their room and hide from it and don't want to be around it. And pretty soon, they're just off doing their own thing. You're going to lose your kids if things turn out that way. But anyway, verse uh, John chapter, chapter 17, verse 20, look at there. He said, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Now underline, if you underline things in your Bible, if you're making notes, let me just say this. There is never unity between people who believe the Bible and people who don't believe the Bible. There's never unity. One, it's just like what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 6. What part hath a believer with an infidel? Infidel means somebody who doesn't believe. They don't believe the Bible. They don't believe what God said. What agreement is there between the two? How is it that we can, we can have, we are saved, born again, Bible-believing Christians, but all we want to do is be around our lost friends and lost family members, there's something not right there because those two never, never, never are going to get along. Because if you're dead set that you believe that every word of God is true in your Bible, that's going to come out of you. And this guy over here, he's not going to have any part of it. You see what I'm saying? Look, Go back and look at that again. He said in verse 20, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. He said, I'm not just asking this for the 12 apostles. I'm asking this for everybody who comes along and reads what they wrote in the New Testament that the 12 apostles and all of the Bible believers through the rest of earth's history, they're all united as one body under Jesus Christ. And the key is always the Word of God. It's the Word of God. Verse 21, they, That they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. Look at your Bible. Now I want you to stop and think about this for a minute. If you are constantly at odds with fa saved family members, saved church members. Um, Lynn, I'm not going to say what it was, but you brought an issue to me this morning, wanted my advice and counsel on it, from a man that attacked her on Facebook. Can you believe that stuff goes on on Facebook? Verbally attacked her in her position about something in the Bible. And I just shook my head, and what I said to you was, that man's ignorant. 
And what I mean by that is he is ignorant of what is in what the Bible actually says about that issue. Okay? There's never going to be an agreement here. Okay? That man is always at odds with those does he claim to be a Christian? Okay. If he did, I'm going to change the story a little bit, make it fit. If he did claim to be a Christian, and yet he is at odds constantly with people who believe, who I know believe the Bible, then he's going to be at odds with God. He cannot be lashing out against everybody that he knows goes to church, and according to this, be right with God. Because that's what it says. That they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. That's how they're going to know it. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. Look at that. Now, the phrase here, the key phrase here is, may be. And it's, I don't think it's a question. I think it's a reference to the future. Because right now, in this world, our unity is not going to be perfect. It's not going to be perfect. My wife and I have... I've been out here and preaching. I hadn't prayed yet. Let's pray and I'll, we'll talk some more. Heavenly Father, I ask your blessings, Lord, on this. Lord, I want to teach it right. I want to be faithful to your word. I don't want to say anything, Lord, that would give anybody any reason to doubt what their Bible says. And so, Father, I pray to your God that you would just add your blessings. Lord, show me which way to go. Show me what direction to turn in this. And let your people be glorified. Let your people be edified. Let them be blessed. Lord, I pray to your God for the unity of this church, that we stand together. And, Father, that through time, as time goes on, Lord, that we learn to grow with one another so that we can be one people as Jesus and the Father are one. Lord, that bless me. You remember, God, you remember the day better than I do. That day when I read those words and I started crying and I saw the love and the hope that Jesus had for His disciples for his people God I know you hear the prayers of your son and I know you're going to answer those prayers by and by so father help us to trust you and Lord help us dear God to seek unity but never at the cost of what we believe Father, bless the message today. Bless our hearts today. Feed us, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, in 30 years, Lisa and I, we've been through some waves. The boat's been rocky a little bit. She saw something one way, I saw it another. And we'd clash. And I never did like that. She didn't like it either. We... Right now, I mean, we're not perfect, but we try to avoid it as much as possible. I don't want to clash with her. She doesn't want to clash with me. We don't want to spend the day being at odds with one another. When God said that, you know, the man shall leave his father and his mother shall cleave to his wife and they too shall become one flesh, I believe that. I believe in marriage there should be a unity Unified as best as possible. But it would take another 30 years for me to finally bring her around to my way of seeing everything. That was a joke. I'm not sure that it would happen in 30 years. And what I'm saying to you is, we still have a little disagreements on things. What we've learned to do to save our marriage... What we learn to do is just go to God with it. She prays for me, and I pray for her, and I ask God to change either me or her, or just put a spirit of unity between us so that we're not fighting. Amen? Now, 
He says in verse 23, I am them and thou and me, that they may be made perfect in one. See, he, he's talking about there is going to come a time when we're all going to get along, we're all going to agree on everything. That's in heaven. That's what the may be is about. It's not a maybe question. It is one of these days is how it's going to happen. That they may be made perfect in one. And that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them and as thou hast loved me. Now, I want you to look at your Bible. God loves Jesus, his only begotten son. Amen? Your Bible just said that God loves you the exact way that he loves his only begotten son. I, mind is blown now. I cannot, I cannot wrap my mind around that statement. That God would love me exactly the same way that he loves Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was the good son. And I'm not. And yet he loves me in exactly the same way as he loves his only begotten son. That's big stuff. Okay? And I'll say this. There's a little mini message in here. Every now and then, when my kids were little, they'd get into it with one another. My perfect little angel preacher's children. They'd get at each other. And they'd both come running to mom and dad. Mom, she did this. Mom, she did that. And what, what they want us to do is launch the full measure of our wrath against the other sibling. So they can say... I did that. And they they never saw that we loved each child as much as we loved the other child. And trying to make us choose which one we're going to be mad at or which one we're going to favor, that hurts us. It hurts us as parents. Amen? When you have two friends and these two friends are fighting and they're both coming to you to pour out their garbage that they've got against this other person that you are friends with, what do you do? See, they try to drag you in it and you don't want to be in it. Why? Because you love them both. And it's not fair that they should bring you into something that they themselves are not willing to work out amongst themselves. You see where I'm see where I'm going with this. Okay? It's not fair to do that. It hurts. So think about God who loves us as much as he loves his only begotten son and he loves his only begotten son. He's not going to favor us more than his son and he's not going to favor his son more than us. He loves us equally the same. So, what I'm saying is, let's not be at odds with Jesus Christ. Let's be one with what we know to be the very presence of Jesus Christ and God's Holy Spirit right here, God's Word. When you get, when you get your mind unified with that, come on in, I saw you pull your truck in out here. Good to see you guys again. When, when, what was I saying now? It's good. Yeah, when, when you get your mind right and unified with this book, you'll find that you won't have a problem with what God does and how He does this and how He does that. When your mind's right according to the Bible. And I'll, I mean, you take that and apply it now to every situation in life. If there's trouble going on in your marriage, if there's trouble going on in friendships or relationships, or whatever it is, if those people get their mind in the Bible and get their heart right with God, those problems will go away. Because it is the prayer of Jesus that God's people 
be as one. I have this as part of my body. It looks like five fingers, but actually it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen separate bones in just the five fingers of my hands. But all of this together makes one hand. Does that make sense to everybody? Which part of this hand would I really like to just cut off and not be a part of me anymore? None of it! I want to keep every bone and every piece of skin cells and every blood that I've got in my hand, I want to keep it there. Amen? I want my hand to be whole. I want it to be right. So I'm not willing that any of these should perish but that all of these would come to repentance. Does that make sense now? Uh, turn to, well, let me read this to you very quickly. Genesis 2, 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. One flesh. 1 Corinthians 6, turn there. 1 Corinthians 6. Verse 15. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Everybody that's looking at me now, if you are born again, saved, Bible believing, every one is a member of the body of of Jesus Christ. Every one. When God made me, He gave me five fingers in each hand, five toes in each foot, gave me a liver, two kidneys, two lungs, an oversized stomach. No, I did that one. Two eyes, two ears, two nostrils, and a mouth. Okay? He gave me everything in my body, and I'd like to keep everything in my body. I don't like surgeries. I don't like having things taken out. I, I mean, I, just, I have to have it sometimes, but I don't like having things taken I do, would not want to make the decision to cut off my own hand just to save the rest of the body. I would not want that decision to be made. But sometimes it's necessary. Do you agree? Okay. I, I know a story, but I, sometimes I don't want to tell it because it's pretty rough. But everybody in this room, you need to understand... That God does not love you any less than He loves anybody else. So let's do this for a minute, okay? And let's be honest in God's house. And if you don't, if you don't want to do this, that's fine. I understand. If you have ever, ever struggled with whether or not God loves you, would you raise your hand? I've struggled with it. Okay? And I would read things in the Bible that God was going to use to lift me up. And automatically, I would read somewhere in there, and it would just make me think that, well, God means that to people who are a lot better than me. He doesn't mean it to me, even though He said it. That must not be for me. That's got to be for people who are better than me. Have you ever thought that before? I have. Because when you're going through problems, I'll tell you to read your Bible. I'll tell you to believe that. And believing it, the hard part about believing it is believing that God loves you exactly the same way as He loves Jesus Christ, even though you are full of sin. Now, did God do something to prove to you that He loves you as much as He loves His only begotten Son? What? Huh? He sent His Son to do what? 
die for you. The sinless son dying and paying the price for the sinful son. That is proof enough that God loves you as much as he loves his only begotten son. What more do you want God to do to prove to you that He loves you that way? How much more do you need? My goodness, He sent His only begotten Son to die in our place and to take our punishment. Isn't that good enough? It is with me. God didn't have to do that. But He did it. Because He loves you that way. So if you're a member of the body of Christ, know this, that God loves you as much as He loves everybody else that's part of the body of Jesus Christ. Jeremy, God loves you as much as He loves Brother George back here. And in all the years, 6,000 years of of human history, God has never altered the love that He has for you and favored George more than you. Never. Never. Sasha, God loves you the same way He loves your mother-in-law, Nancy. He knows both of you. He cares equally about both of you. And he has an amazing amount of grace to sustain both of you because he loves you equally the same. Ron and Sandy, God loves you both exactly the same. And he has grace and mercy for both of you as much as you need it. That's how much God has for you. And he's got plenty more where that came from. God is, the Bible says God is rich in mercy. Maybe, maybe you did ask God to pay your bills and God paid them, but that's, that's not it. You ask God to forgive your sins. God's the wealthiest man in the universe when it comes to paying off sin debt. Amen. So if you're a member of the body of Christ, you're a member of the body of Christ. And God's not looking to tear off anything that's part of the body of His Son. Know you not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. What? Know you not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. Now I'm going to say something. Okay, this is just a little side extra that this part of the Scripture deals with. I'm going to say something. Hang on a second. I have dry mouth this morning. If you're sitting here or you're watching me online and you are actively participating in adultery, I want you to know that God knows it and God sees it. And if you think that you're going to keep getting away with it, you are wrong. You're in danger because the book of Proverbs tells us that the path that the strange woman is on is the path to hell. Am I right? Now, do I know things? No, I don't know anything. But I just read that and that's what I feel God was telling me to say. There may be somebody here, there may be somebody. Listen, I've been in church a long time. And it does not surprise me when I hear things going on about church members, things they ought not be doing. It doesn't surprise me anymore. But according to the Bible, if you are actively participating in things, either that or things related to it, don't think for a minute that you're going to keep getting away with it. Because if you're, if you're God's child, you cannot fathom the rod that is going to come against you. You have no idea what a whipping's like until you get one from God. 
So if I were you and I were real smart, I'd knock it off or ask God to do it for you. And all of God's people said, Now, verse 17, But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Let's see here. Who can I pick on? Todd. How you doing, Todd? Do you believe the Bible? King James? 1611? So why? Do you know where one spirit comes from? One Bible. It comes from one Bible. I just, I'm just telling you how I am. I just can't listen to someone preach out of these new Bibles. I can't do it. It just, I can't. People send me books. Pastor Mike, you need to read this book. Now, he's not using the King James, but he's, a, I don't read it. I don't read it. I don't trust it. I automatically don't trust anything that that man says. So I'm not going to read it. I'm not going to have anything to do with it. So don't send it to me unless you want me to see the errors that you saw in there. And then I'll probably use it one day. But I just don't get anything out of that. That is a different spirit than the one that God has put in me. I can't apologize for it because I didn't do it. God did. God did this with me. God made me this way. So I can't apologize to anybody for what I believe and what I stand on. I just stand on it. And if you stand with me, then praise the Lord. Amen. God has given us one spirit. Now, what happens when conflict arises between two brothers, two sisters, or a brother and sister in Christ? What, what happens? Here's what, here's what God always blesses. Two people get in disagreement, and they both settle it. By the Word of God. They let the Bible say what the Bible says to everybody. And those who are wrong receive it and are glad to be corrected. And their pride doesn't get in the way. And those who were right according to the Scripture, they don't get proud and cocky, go around high-fiving all their teammates that they got one over on that person there because I was right to begin with. They don't do that. They humble themselves and they say, God, thank you for doing away with this disagreement between so-and-so and I. That will work in every marriage. It will work in every family. It will work in every church. It will work in every place, anywhere. If there is one spirit between those people, they will be happy to have it settled by God's holy word. Brother Reg Kelly preached one of the first times I heard him preach about there was a he, he started a Christian school out at his church. And um, things were going. He thought it was going to go pretty well. But he said there were some people in the church that were working for the school, the public school in that area. And he said he found out that they were actively behind the scenes working to get that Christian school shut down because they were pulling kids out of the public school and they were putting their kids in this Christian school. And those kids in that public school, that's tax money that they're not getting. So that people working behind the scenes to get this school destroyed. And so what happened was they decided they was going to have a board meeting. And some guys on the board were going to say, well, you can have your school, but any expenditure over $25 has to be approved by the board before you can spend the money for the school. That's ridiculous. And so, Reg, he said, I, he said, I went into prayer. He said, I wept over it. I fasted over it. And he said, we had the meeting. And he said, you could just hear a pin drop in that meeting. He said, just cold as ice. And Reg said, he said, now before, he said, I already know what this meeting's about. He said, before we start this meeting, he said, I want you to hear me out on something. And he said, I did not have a cocky spirit at all. He said, I was very humble. And he said, I was submitting myself to these men. And he said to them, if you men can show me in the Bible where a local church congregation is run by a board that has all the authority, then I will gladly submit to that 
and there'll be no need for this meeting. You can do what you want. And he said, the room got still. Dead silence. And after a while, one of the men spoke up and said, Brother Reg, I don't even see in the Bible where there is to be a board that runs the church. Now, in the multitude, I'm not getting rid of my board. In the multitude of counselors, there's safety. Okay? And God has always blessed our board meetings in that we, we kind of get along. And I'm not willing to push any agenda that I think the guys on the board would not be happy about just to go against them because I think it's God's will. We found out that if it's God's will, He just puts it in everybody's heart and we do it. And that's how it works. That's how it's supposed to work. But the thing is, He let God decide that meeting and how it was going to go and God blessed that. Because all of those men submitted to the authority of the one spirit that we have. And that is the one Bible that we have. So let me finish this. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth without, is without the body. But he that committed fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God? And ye are not your own. For you are... By the way, you women... Abortion people who say that the woman has the right to choose what's done with her body. Not according to the Bible. If that, if that woman's saved, number one, if she's really saved, she won't want to kill her baby. Okay? But that your body, it's, it's, it does not belong to you. You were bought for the price. You're not your own. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now, let me back up here. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinned against his own body. And your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own. You cannot be a practicing, Bible-believing Christian joined with a local congregation and then be part of some organization or some other religion or some other deal whose religious and ideological beliefs are in stark contrast to the beliefs of the Bible. You cannot be that. What that is, is here in this church, it is my responsibility to make sure that everybody in this church remains a member of the body of Jesus Christ. And I'm like Paul, it's I got to present this church as part of the body of Christ as a chaste virgin to Jesus Christ. That means if I put up with you going out being part of everything else in the world, then I'm allowing you to go out and harlot yourself with other gods. And I can't do it. I've had people ask me, are you, are you part of the Minister Alliance in, in Festus? No. Why not? Because I don't go along with them. I don't think I should sit on a board with men who I know trample on the Word of God in their religious practices, who trample on the Word of God. I will not be a part of that. Because i got to set an example. I would not want my people in my church to be part of anything like that either. You think about what you may be hooked in with or what you may have thought about joining with. Because I'm telling you, there are ways, very simple ways, that you can walk out of this place and go fornicate with some other God or some other religious ideology or some other philosophy or whatever the sin the world offers you. And now you have dirtied up the virgin body that belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. You want to be part of the body? Come out of this world. Start analyzing your life and what you do, what you're part of, what you watch, what you listen to, what you follow, what, what philosophical ideas that you have that are in contradiction to the Word of God. You start going in this Bible and let God show you things that you need to come out of. Because when Christ is ready to marry His bride, She's going to be clean. And she's going to be one 
with everybody else. And God's not going to treat your sin any differently than he treated anybody else's sin. Amen? Let's stand to our feet. I knew I wouldn't get to the end of this. I want unity in my family. I want unity between Lisa and I. I want unity between my girls and I. Unity between my sons-in-law and Lisa and I. Unity, there's always unity between grandkids and people. We always agree, as long as I got candy. I want unity in this church. And I'm going to show you from the Bible. Unity does not mean uniformity. God did not cut us all out of the same cloth. We are not going to be all like little robots that were made on a production line where we're all just look exactly the same, think exactly the same. There is variances and differences, are there not? You learn how to handle that. God will bless you. Okay? So that may be where we're going to head next week, all right? That's, that's a little glimpse of what we're going to deal with up there on screen. Just a glimpse of what we're going to deal with, all right? Some of you know what that means. Okay? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. I love you. Uh, just with every head bowed, every eye closed, I just want to ask you, is anybody here just need God to really help them deal with some issues in life related to unity. Okay? There's some raising their hand. There's some, there's some more. There's some more. Thank you. Appreciate, appreciate that honesty. I appreciate that. Okay? Nobody's looking at you. Appreciate that. Okay? You're just, you're struggling with unity. Okay? Give it to Christ. Put it under the blood. Let God have it. All right? Let God decide the reasons for it. Maybe God is trying to pull you out of some things. And, or maybe God is trying to work in you some things. I don't know. But let God have it. Let Him do what He wants to do. So we're going to pray for you this morning. Heavenly Father, thank You, Lord, for honesty here in Your house. I love this church. I love this church. Because, Father, we just we have to come in here and we have to deal with us. We have to be honest about it. Not try to hide our sins under a fig leaf. But, Father, I appreciate, Lord, those that raise their hand and those, Lord, whose heart, Father, is open to You, understanding, God, that there's friction. Things that are not right between them and other people. Or maybe they're not right with you. So, Father, work in each person's life the way that they would need you to work in them. Do things, Father, that I can't do. Do things, Father, that they can't do. Because you love them as much as you love Jesus. And, God, I still don't... I don't understand it, God, because when I, my nature is, God, when people do me wrong, I want nothing to do with them. That's me, God. Your ways must be higher than my ways. For you to still love me, even though I've done things against you. God, thank you for loving me the way you love Jesus. Thank you for loving these people the way you love Jesus. And God, I pray, dear God, that you would minister as those who have needs. Minister to those, Lord, and a manifest token of your love for them that you have forgiven them, will forgive them. You sent your only begotten Son for them so that they could be one with Christ's body as Christ and God are one. Father, just give them grace and comfort from the Scriptures today. 
Bring them, Lord, to oneness, to unity. Bless and honor your word today, we pray in Jesus' name. All the God's people said,